As I've mentioned previously, our discussion of rotation has closely mirrored our journey through physics and mechanics as a whole. We talked about kinematics and rotational kinematics. We've talked about force and its rotational equivalent, torque. We talked about linear momentum and its rotational equivalent, angular momentum. And now we're going to extend that one step further to talking about energy, specifically with relation to rotational kinetic energy. And, this being the final video in the unit on rotation, we will also discuss a very common uh, phenomenon we see, which is that of an object rolling. So just to act as a brief reminder on kinetic energy, that type of energy is motion energy, and we calculate using the equation k equals one-half mv squared, where m is the mass of the object in kilograms, and v is its velocity in meters per second. It is a scalar quantity, meaning it doesn't have direction, just a magnitude, and additionally the unit of kinetic energy and all the other types of energy we worked with was joules, which we abbreviate with a capital J. But there's really an addendum we should make to all of this, which is that this is really just the translational kinetic energy of an object, and it describes the translational motion energy that it possesses. Additionally, when we have k equals 1 half mv squared, that v is specifically the linear velocity of an object. It's translational side-to-side -side velocity. Because, unsurprisingly, we have a rotational equivalent to this, known as rotational kinetic energy, which is the rotational motion energy that an object possesses. And we can actually probably give a good guess on what the equation for rotational kinetic energy will be. We had k equals one half mv squared. Well, what's the rotational equivalent of m is rotational inertia i. The rotational equivalent of velocity v is the angular velocity omega. So I'm just going to substitute those two quantities in, and we get k rot equals one half i omega squared where k rot, just k r o t, is the rotational kinetic energy, i is the rotational inertia in kilograms per meter squared, and omega is the angular velocity in radians per second. Just a quick note, I write it this way, I've seen other people write it differently, some will just do k r, and then do k t for translational. There's many different ways to do it, but we just want to make sure we distinguish between translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy. Rotational kinetic energy is also a scalar, like all other types of energy, but what exactly is its unit? Well, let's have a brief reminder of what exactly a joule is by looking at the linear kinetic energy equation. Well, I have kilograms times meters per second, and that meters per second is squared. So this is the mass, this is the velocity squared. The one half is just a constant. So my units would be kilograms times meters squared per second squared. So a joule is defined as a kilogram meter squared per second squared. Well, let's look at the angular velocity version. I'm going to have the rotational inertia, which is kilograms per meter squared times radians per second, and that value is squared. And that's going to be 1 over s squared. But remember, radians is not really a unit. It's just really a placeholder. So this results in kilograms per meter squared per second squared. Well, lucky for us, that's the exact same thing. So the unit of rotational kinetic energy is also joules. And this actually makes our life a bit easier because, for instance, when we did linear momentum and angular momentum, it's very easy to think that those are two sides of the same coin, but they're really not. They're really two separate concepts. We can, cannot combine those two quantities. But we can combine translational kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy into a single value because they are both in units of joules. They're both measuring the same type of thing. So way back when, when we looked at energy and we defined it into a few key categories of kinetic, potential, and thermal, we talked about the fact that potential energy can come in a variety of different types. But the thing is, though, is that kinetic also comes in a couple of different types, translational and rotational being two key parts of this. And so when we talk about the mechanical energy of an object, yes, it possesses potentially uh, gravitational potential energy and elastic potential energy and translational kinetic energy, but now we need to consider rotational kinetic energy in that expression as well. So let's look at a brief example. Let's say a disk has a mass of 40 kilograms and a radius of 2 meters. How much work is necessary to speed it up from an angular velocity of 10 radians per second to 30 radians per second. So we're imagining this disk is like on some axle, and basically it's just going to be uh, sped up so it's spinning faster. It's not moving through space, it's just rotating. And so how much work? Okay, well, what was work again? It's been a while. Remember that a work 
is a change in energy. And for this class, I'll be a change in mechanical energy. And that can be one of a few different types. That can be the translational kinetic energy, which I put with a small t here just to help me keep it straight. That could be rotational kinetic energy. That could be delta ug, or that could be delta us. But for this particular situation, we're not going to have any of that that or that we're just going to have rotational kinetic energy so the change in rotational kinetic energy would just be one half i omega squared minus one half i omega not squared or if i want to simplify this a little bit one half i for this rotational inertia of a disc is one half m r squared and we have the mass and radius and then remember we can do omega squared minus omega not squared key key thing to remember call you cannot pull this squared out that is not how algebra works, unfortunately. So you have to keep it like this. And now I'm just going to stick my numbers in. I'll have 1 half times i, which is 1 half times 40 times 2 squared, times 30 radians per second squared minus 10 radians per second squared. Plug that in my calculator. I'm not doing this in my head. And we get a work of 32,000 joules. You have to add energy to the disk for it to speed up by this amount. The concept of rotational kinetic energy is pretty simple, but we're going to use it to help us analyze a situation that on the surface is very, very common, but we're going to see there's actually some pretty hidden details that we don't always notice. And that's with this concept of rolling. So when an object rolls, it's undergoing motion that combines both translational and rotational motion. So for instance, if you imagine a wheel like rolling on the ground, it's not only rotating about some axis, but it's physically moving through space. So it's doing both translational and rotational motion. And let's kind of go through this one step at a time. Let's imagine first that we had um, a wheel here and it had translational motion that caused it to be sliding at v. So it's not rotating, it is just sliding at some speed v, some velocity v. So if we want to show this on the wheel, we would say, okay, well the top the middle and the bottom of the wheel, they're all going to be moving at V, if we say in this particular situation, to the right. So this is imagining the object just, just sliding along. Um, imagine like it's on a frictionless surface, for instance. Okay, so that's the translational motion. But let's say we now look at the rotational motion of a wheel that we'll go ahead and say is rotating at some angular velocity omega, but it's not moving through space. So it's going to be rotating in place, and that is it. So therefore, we could say, all right, we're going to go ahead and say it's going in this direction in the, we say this clockwise direction, omega. I know we usually label that as negative just for the purpose of this exercise. We can just call it omega. We don't need to worry about the negative sign right now. So this is the translational and the rotational, but now let's combine the two together. And if we combine the two together, we get what is known as rolling motion. And if I look at this diagram here, well, I'm just going to transpose the v's and that omega down onto it. So we get something that looks like this. And you might think, all right, that was great. Doesn't seem particularly helpful. How did this help that much? But remember, let's go ahead and define something very, very carefully here, which is that if we look at omega and v, is there some way we can relate these two to each other? And in fact, we can if we go ahead and specifically say, all right, let's say the wheel has some radius r, and we're going to go ahead and define that v is equal to r omega and omega is equal to v over r. Remember, this is how we go between the rotational and translational frames of motion. So we're explicitly saying that the amount that like a point on the edge of the wheel at this point is moving, like its speed at this point is equivalent to the speed that the whole wheel is moving through space. This is very, very, very key. So we are saying, in essence, that this point right here at the top is moving as quickly as the whole wheel is moving to the right. Okay, well, if we do this, we're going to start seeing that things become a little bit different. Because now I could say, all right, well, the wheel is going around at some angular velocity omega. The top of the wheel is going at v to the right. The bottom of the wheel is going at v to the left because it's rotating in place. Here it would be going v down. Here it would be going v up, for instance. But now let's look at these three locations on the rolling diagram. And if we look at these three locations, we start noticing that these velocities combine in different ways at different points on the wheel. So now, for instance, we have something that looks like this.
This is actually just taking this right here and basically combining all the velocity vectors. So at the center of the wheel, at its center of mass, it is moving at this speed v because it gains that from the translational motion. From the rotational motion, the center does not move. So if we combine those two, it's moving at v. And that is typically when we say a wheel is um, rolling at some speed, v, let's say four meters per second, what we really mean is that the center of the wheel, its center of mass, is what's moving through space at that velocity. So that's what we mean by that, is that the center of mass moves at that speed, v. Well, if you look at the top of the wheel, the top of the wheel was moving v from the translational, but it's also moving that direction because it's rotating in that direction. And if we combine those two vectors, we see that the top of the wheel is actually moving at 2v, and lastly, if we look at the bottom of the wheel, it's sliding to the right at V, but it's rotating to the left at V. Well, those vectors would cancel, and we would see that at this point right here, the velocity of the wheel is actually zero. And this hurts our brain a little bit, but we have to keep in mind that this is instantaneous. That instantaneously, at this point, the velocity is zero. As soon as it rolls just a little bit more at the next instant, then there would be a new point at the bottom of the wheel that the velocity is instantaneously zero, then it would move a little bit more, and there'd be a new point, etc. And that's because this point right here is actually the pivot point of the wheel. This is where the whole wheel is moving around. If it was not motionless at the bottom, the whole wheel could not pivot around this point, and the wheel would not roll. It would instead slide. So the bottommost point is instantaneously at rest, and in fact, the whole wheel is rotating at omega around this point, which helps explain why if we go a little further out, this is V, and if we go even further away from this axis of rotation, it's moving even faster at 2V. But there's a very, very important point here. So this is how you know rolling works conceptually, but we used a very, very key distinction here, and that is that we actually use something known as rolling without slipping. When we use this couple of equations right here to move between the angular and the translational situation, those velocities, we are explicitly saying that the wheel is rolling without slipping. And another way to define that is, is if the wheel rotates one time, it moves through one circumference in space. So in other words, as it rolls, it is only gaining its translational motion at the same rate that it's gaining its rotational motion. If it was slipping, which we're not going to worry about, but if it was slipping, it would not only be doing that, but it would also be like sliding a bit as it rolls. Kind of imagine like a, a car hydroplaning, for instance, something like where basically the wheels are spinning, but it's also sliding at the same time. That's much more complicated, and we're not going to worry about that. We're going to look exclusively at rolling without slipping, but that means we need to focus and make sure we see that phrase so that we know we can make this substitution of V equals R omega, and omega is equal to V over R. So while we now have a better conceptual understanding of rolling, of how exactly it physically occurs, how can we use that to help us analyze some situations, particularly with rolling without slipping? So let's say we have a basketball, which we're going to treat like a spherical shell, in other words, a hollow sphere, um, with a rotational inertia of two-thirds mr squared, that's in your table, has a mass of 0 0.65 kilograms and a radius of 25 centimeters. It rolls at 6 meters per second without slipping. Remember when we say it rolls at 6 meters per second, that means the center of mass of the basketball is actually what's moving through space at 6 meters per second. How much mechanical energy does the ball have as it rolls? All right, so let's think about this. Well, I'm going to go ahead and pull up, okay, mechanical energy can be a few different things. It can be translational kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, elastic potential energy, but we're rolling doesn't say we're doing anything, you know, going up or down or anything like that. So we don't have this. There's no springs involved, so we don't have that. So we just have translational and rotational kinetic energy, but we do have both. So we need to consider both of those. So when I put in the two equations, 1 half mv squared plus 1 half i omega squared, and I stuck in the equation for i in this step, which was 2 thirds mr squared. But at this point, you might be thinking, well, now I'm stuck. How can I possibly do this? There, there's no omega. But remember, this says rolling without slipping. As soon as you see that phrase, that should ring alarm bells and tell you, oh, that allows me to use V equals R omega and omega equals V over R. This is super crucial. As soon as you see that phrase, that should immediately pop into your head. And if I do that, I could say, okay, well, let me stick that in for omega. So omega is now going to be V over R 
squared. Specifically, it's going to be big R because it's the radius of the entire basketball. Well, those R's are going to cancel because this is V squared R squared. So those R squareds canceled. This M is the same thing as the mass of the basketball. So I'm just going to make that a little M. And additionally, well, one half times two thirds, that's the same thing as one third. So now I'm actually left with one half MV squared plus this term becomes one third MV squared. So now I could stick in for the basketball, one half plus one third times the mass, which is 0.65 kilograms, times V squared, which was six meters per second squared, plug that in my calculator, and I get a total mechanical energy of 19.5 joules. So in other words, because the ball was rolling, if it was just sliding, it would only have translational kinetic energy. But since it's rolling, it also has a rotational kinetic energy factor. It actually has more energy than it would if it was just sliding along the ground. So let's look at one final situation, and you're more than welcome to pause this and try this problem on your own. I think many of you could be able to handle that just fine, but I'm going to go ahead and just go through it now just to keep up on time. So let's say we have a wheel. We'll go ahead and say that's like a hoop with i equals mr squared. So this picture here, imagine this is like a ring of something, and the inside is hollow. With a mass of 4 kilograms and a radius of 0.5 meters is at rest at the top of a 2 meter high and climb a ramp. The wheel then rolls without slipping to the bottom of the ramp, and we want to know what is the speed of the wheel at the bottom. Well, okay, well, let's go ahead and, you know, imagine that this was not rolling. Let's just say it was at the top of the ramp and it slid down. Well, how would we go about solving this problem? I think most of you would probably take the easiest route, which would be conservation of energy. You say that the energy of the system at the beginning specifically would be the like wheel earth system, for instance, as the energy of the system at the end. And if we looked, we would say, okay, well, at the beginning, the only type of energy, so this is at this point here, this is our initial, and this is our final. So at our initial situation, we only have gravitational potential energy because it's not moving yet. There's no springs. And at the end, usually we would be like, oh, well, we just have kinetic energy. But the thing is, though, is that since it's now rolling, we have both translational and rotational kinetic energy. So we just need to consider both of those factors. So now let's go ahead and plug in some equations. So I'm going to have mgy0 is equal to 1 half mv squared plus 1 half i omega squared. And I can go ahead and stick in you know, my equation for I, and additionally, keeping in mind that this is without slipping, remember that should ring off alarm bells, I know I can immediately plug in for omega V over R. And if I look, now I can once again simplify some things. I can get rid of those R squareds, and so I have MGY0 is equal to 1 half MV squared plus 1 half MV squared, so 1 half plus 1 half is just 1, so MGY0 is equal to MV squared. I can get rid of the mass term, that ends up not mattering either, and I'm left with V is equal to the square root of G Y naught. So I stick in G, which is 10 meters per second squared, Y naught, which was 2 meters, I take the square root, and we get that the speed at the bottom of the ramp as it's rolling is 4.47 meters per second. So that concludes our unit on rotational motion with this video of rotational kinetic energy and rolling. And at this point, we just want to make sure we can do the following. Can we determine when an object possesses rotational kinetic energy, aka if it's rotating, and can we calculate its magnitude using k rot equals a one half i omega squared? Can we describe what rolling motion entails? That's a combination of translational and rotational motion. Can we specifically describe how different points on a rolling object move through space? That the top moves at 2v, the center point moves at v, and the bottom actually is instantaneously at rest. Can we combine translational and rotational kinetic energies for an object that rolls without slipping? aka when we can use v equals r omega or omega equals v over r, and then combine those two expressions to solve problems. If we can do that, we should be all set.